A good life is a life built around fulfilling work, play, relationships, and lifelong learning. Welcome to Good Life Conversations, where we explore the stories and strategies of inspiring everyday people who are striving to create a life of purpose, meaning, and connection. Hi there, welcome to this Good Life Conversation. My name is Jay, I'm your host and the founder of Discover Year. Today's guest is Kara Stonehouse. Welcome, Kara. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And Kara and I uh, met, again, like like many of our mentors, probably seven, eight years ago, I think. And um, Kara is the uh, owner of a business called AHA Graphic Facilitation. And I suspect that many people listening have never heard of graphic facilitation. So we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Kara is an industrial designer. She's uh, an artist. And we'll talk a little bit about how she's created this really cool job for herself. Um, we met, in fact, when I was facilitating a team building session, and Kara was also there facilitating artwork for this retreat uh, of, a, of a, a department within the, the government. So I was helping teams communicate more effectively, and Kara was kind of uh, visually adapting everything that she saw in those meetings, which I had never seen before. And I was I thought it was so cool that this was a thing. Um, and maybe Kara will even uh, be able to tell us a little bit about what that looks like. So Let's dive in, Kara. Um, and I know there's a lot of creatives and artists that uh, kind of surround the Discover Your uh, community. So we always like to start with the same question, and that is typical day for Kara. What time do you wake up? Do you have any morning routines? What does your work day look like? How do you wind down the day? What time do you go to bed? What does it look like for you? Oh, well, I've been quite a night owl from when I was a teenager and into university um, but when you have children that that switches so you have to because you have this built-in alarm clock who need to you to you need to feed these young people every day um, so I so nowadays I I get up and take the kids to to school so we live in a really in a small town in France and um, so we can walk we walk them to school and then sometimes because um, I've I work for myself and I, I work from home. I don't have to commute. So that's something I really loved about moving to France is I don't have to take that arm prior Ottawa commute so many times a week um, anymore. That really frees up a lot of life energy. So then what I'm doing instead is walking through the fields and seeing the sun come up and um, connecting with nature and singing in the field as if I'm like a superstar to all these uh, imaginary people in the field and um and that just gives me a lot of joy in my morning um and it sort of helps me clarify as well my vision and uh and who i feel i'm i want to be in the world and then um and then i just have emails and work and i have to i have clients who will email me and they need a quote so i like to meet them in on zoom uh, before i quote i find that makes a really big difference um if i just send someone give me money, you know, they don't, they don't, I click like 50% chance that they'll say yes. But if I meet them and say, Oh, what are you doing? What are your needs? What, uh, Oh, this is such an interesting event, you know, and they get to know me and then it's like 90% chance that they will say yes, um, to the quote because, um, happily with this artistic, um, service that I give of drawing pictures of people's visions and, and events, it's actually a highly paid artistic, um, job. So I was so, thrilled when I when I found out that this exists and that businesses and governments will pay you a good amount um, per day and so um so I make the quotes and um and then once in a while I'll go and do the drawings a couple of days a month to go and put up a big piece of paper and I have my markers and I'm listening to what they're saying and I know about I know how businesses work and how the vision how the visioning process works so I draw a big a big mountain we're going up the mountain and then I draw a big road we're going down the road you're going to get there and then I show the steps that they're talking about that they want to create and then they see their vision on the wall and oh that's so cool and that makes them happy and it makes me happy and they say I can't believe you did this <laughs> so, um, so, um, so that's a real great part and now that I've moved I've grown my business um, the more of them I do people see it and then that's how I get more clients and repeat clients and so now I can have two staff uh, with me to do the ones that I can't do now that I've moved away with my family to France and so I'm often also 
stay up quite late uh, once in a while because I have to, so many creative ideas and projects that I'm up to um, after I put the kids to bed at 9 p.m. I'll have a few more meetings and things till 11 and if I'm like writing a grant I'll stay up till midnight one o'clock two o'clock sometimes still uh, so I just really have a lot of creative energy at that late night and then I have to mm. still wake up for the kids in the morning so. <laughs> um yeah and then sometimes I'm working at home by the fire on my iPad to do a bigger drawing that's um that's that's not a live drawing and that's so I can still work for government of Canada clients here from France so I was really lucky in that that COVID actually let opened everyone's mind to working remotely more and that's really benefited me you know, luckily mm. very cool night owl turned half night owl because it sounds like you still stay up late sometimes but uh but not always you have to balance with my poor husband. He wakes up easily. He doesn't like me coming in late at night, just staring his sleep. He's like, are you ever going to change? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't think I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. We do talk about this, um, as we mentioned briefly before we started recording, you know, a, a good part of our intended messaging with these um, sessions is to help young people understand that it's a process and it's not like you all of a sudden wake up one morning and decide you're going to change and then it happens or decide, you know, that you figured it out and you're going to implement your plan. It's always a work in progress. So um, it sounds like for you, you still really enjoy and find those late hours productive for you. Yeah, Very interesting. And yeah. And so I take it more easy in the mornings. Um, but mm -hmm. then sometimes it gets me a little bit squished in the afternoon. I'm like, ah, <laughs> yeah. um, and a little bit of that, you know, that procrastination and that kind of ADD tendencies um, that uh, artists often have make it sometimes harder to focus during the day. And uh, uh, so you have to just develop your strategies to calm myself or to, oh, I learned this great tip. They said, um, you know, like I'll, I'll do my to-do list and I'll like, I'll write down the list and then go do exactly not that for like hours and hours, you know? And they said, make the to-do list like so simple, like, like open the document, like make that a check mark on your list. And that actually worked. So I was like, oh, I can open the document. And then once I have the document open, I can get there as long as I just don't go to Facebook something first, you know? So, um, uh -huh. so we're, yeah, always a bit of a struggle with that internal uh, procrastination. That one, that's such that's a sticky one for sure. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Let's it's maybe sort of process. Back yeah, sorry. It's a part of the process also of being a creative system thinker as you your brain's doing stuff in the background uh, and then it kind of all pops out at the end. But often that means a squishy deadline and a late night and a disrupted family. So you have to you have to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have to balance. Yeah. Very interesting. I th I really like that and there's a lot of students um in discovery year, year over year who have uh, ADHD tendencies or are diagnosed as ADHD. And so I think that they, they'll connect to some of these ideas. Maybe we can circle back to that about this idea of procrastination. And in fact, it's sometimes useful to do that, but it's always something you need to be mindful of rather than just saying, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm never going to procrastinate, you know, like that's sometimes what people think they should be achieving, which is obviously mm -hmm. unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. You can't force yourself because it's, it's back in the back of your brain. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that you that you touched upon, which I didn't mention in the introduction here, is that you you are Canadian and you moved to France. Was that during COVID? Tell us a little bit about when you did that, what your reasoning was, and what you've learned in the process, if you don't mind. Um, I got an opportunity to go do sustainable industrial design in England when I was in my 20s. And so I jumped at that chance because I wanted to, I was like, well, sustainable design, I want my life I don't want to make all this plastic crap, but that's just going to like add up in the environment. I, ooh, I can't let that be my career, but I wanted to make things and be an inventor and be artistic and, um, and bring people joy. Um, so I thought, Oh, sustainable design. Great, great, great. So I did that. And uh, so I met my husband in, in England. Um, and then he came back to Canada with me, but he just didn't really like the winters or the summers like the winters are too cold and the summers are too hot I'm never happy <laughs> oh boy uh, so he's like please can we go to Europe uh, oh geez uh, uh so I was like all right well five more years in Canada and then he's like five years are up I'm like oh god <laughs> so, uh, so we went uh, when we came here to France because his mom has retired here so 
we are at least have a, a family unit here and uh, I'm, it's really, I'm really enjoying it because it's a socialist country and they really care about sustainability and they make it easy to get solar panels and it's easier to have an electric car and all that. So um, except for trying to fly home to see my family often, I have a much greener lifestyle. So I, I really like that. Mm. And so, so pre previous to your, to your husband saying, Hey, I can't deal with the weather here. Had you ever envisioned yourself moving overseas at, at some point? I mean, I, I fell in love with the Fintorn eco village, the idea, I read this book that these there's people and they're, they're kind of magical and they're real, like, and they like make these magic gardens that grow. And I was like, this is real, like what? And so I wanted to explore that, um, having that feeling like reading books when there was a shaman in it or something. I was like, Oh, I, I'd like to be a shaman or something. Um, and so then then my friend said, there's really, that really exists. Like there are people who are really do this spiritual work. And so I wanted to go visit this eco village. And then when that, it was near to where I was working in England. So that was kind of like my motivator to go, um, to jump over the sea. But I never, it always seemed like such a big thing, too big, but this, I got an opportunity through, um, I guess it was a company that has a Toronto office and an England office. So I did my, my internship with the Toronto office for a year. And that's how they knew about me in England and they needed a designer there and they recruited me over. So mm. it's nice to have something to go to, you know, and they said, we'll fly you to England. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And, and so is there anything having kind of not previously imagined yourself living kind of more permanently overseas is there anything that is different about the lifestyle than you expected or is there anything that you've learned about you know living abroad what i found about when i first went to england um you know you're taking away from all your contacts and all your family and all your friends so it was a space a little bit sad and lonely but um a space to really discover who i am from within my own frame of reference from my own uh, no sort of judgments or pressures from anybody um so i thought that was really valuable so i did a lot of journaling and exploring and and reading and going to this eco village and having some really opening experiences there from being sort of like closed hearted to being open hearted and then starting to do um, other spiritual practices and then that's really taken that's really become really part of my big work in the world is, is really supporting me um, mm. so that and I wouldn't do I wouldn't have done that just doing my everyday life in Canada because it's it's like weird and you know uh, what would people think and what where would I go or why sort of so um, uh, so that's what I found like it would help me really see see myself mm. and think about myself in that time of life when I was 21 22 you know, wondering, you know, in that time to figure out that kind of, that kind mm. of quest. <laughs> yeah. Who am I? There's a term that sometimes people use to describe what you just talked about, which is uh, repotting. So it's kind of a metaphor to think about, you know, picking up if the individual is a flower or a plant, picking them up and repotting them in a new flower bed or in a new plant. Um, and, oftentimes the impact of that is as you described you know you don't have any of the constraints the societal the familial constraints so people really have an opportunity to find themselves again and to better understand themselves in a new context so um, i think that's interesting to hear and hopefully uh, others can you know push themselves outside of their comfort zones a little bit to get that experience yeah and there was a book i went through called the quest and so it asked you all these questions and i did that like with the group and it said oh let's do this quest group uh every week you know and so that's supported I, and i've always used that technique of when i want to learn something and do something i invite if i organize it for a few people and that actually makes me accountable to doing mm -hmm. it and that's really that's how i get things done nice how did you how did you learn that that was a useful technique for you just by doing it i guess uh and i i that might have been one of the first ones that i did and then now I always use that technique. So right now I want to launch courses with my spiritual work, which is kind of scary again, because it's spiritual work is kind of weird sometimes. And so I did the same thing. I said, I'm going to make a course for people who have like artistic and spiritual gifts. And how do you turn that into a business? And so I said, come on, friends, let's do this course together. And so it's, it's that. And so same process I'm doing again. Very cool. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you. I, I, uh, I'm sure perhaps our question, our students might have more questions about, you know, what it's like to live in France and, and other, um, things you've learned along the way. I would love to explore this, uh, idea of, 
uh, graphic facilitation. And perhaps we can take one step back and describe, you know, I only mentioned briefly that you studied industrial design and you mentioned you wanted sustainable design, sustainable products, but can you briefly just describe for everyone what, what it means to be studying industrial design or to be an industrial designer? And then tell us a little bit how you came to learn about graphic facilitation and, and what that is. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I chose graphic design. I chose industrial design because I was I loved art and I loved um, making things with my hand and sort. And I was like, maybe I could be an inventor. Is that a job? <laughs> you know. And uh, and I was thinking like, I want to make people happy. And I thought like, happy inventor is like I could make toys. I could be like a toy designer. And then so I started telling that to a few adults. And then someone knew that my cousin was taking industrial design, and that was the name of someone who designs products. And so mm. then I looked that up, and it was at Carleton University, which is in Ottawa, which is right where I live. And so I put my portfolio together because I had taken art classes, so I had a pretty good portfolio, and I uh, got. I got in and so the industrial designer thinks about a product from the first from the user's point of view so how am i gonna how am i gonna open it and how is it and we're gonna make it look pretty so it's not just metal but like but how is the machine how are we gonna how's the machine gonna make this bottle and how's it gonna come off and then this plastic part has to go on and this is two different plastics that are put together and so you just so you learn all about the all about the um how the industry makes a product and then you get to add the the art and the humanity uh to it as well so that's why it's a really nice mixture of of practical and and creative so that's what i loved about it but um i didn't actually thrive as an industrial designer because it's a lot of time on 3d cad looking at them how many millimeters apart things are and which screws to use and, and that kind of thing and um and just wasn't I wasn't <laughs> I don't go that far into details. I'm I'm much I'm a real visionary uh person. And so now I'm using my art in a much more visionary uh way. But a lot of the skills I knew even I I felt sad when I was when I was learning industrial design. Like it was it was like it'd take a long time, it was late nights, it was dark, gotta be up too late too many times. And uh, I was just like, I'm so sad, <laughs> you know? mm. but I didn't quit. Like I said, if I quit, I'm going to lose, you lose it all. Like you don't get a degree. So I'm like, I know I can take this degree. I hear a lot that people get a degree and then you can move on from there. So I'm like, I'm doing, there's a lot of skills here. I'm going to get the degree and then I, maybe I'll jump on from there. So then I jumped onto sustainability and, and kept going from there. But the, but I got a job in industrial design that was fun, like making soap dispensers. And then that was able, I was able to make money, like a decent salary there. And then I could save up and do the next thing and find my master's degree and bop, de bop, de bop. So, yeah. Very interesting. So yeah. is it is it safe to say that when you were applying to university, you and you kind of saw yourself as a, as a creative or an artist? And how did that show up when you were a kid? Were you a painter, a drawer? Like, what did you do that was artistic growing up? My mom made me a whole art room. So, uh, and then she bought a uh, a book about paper mache and pop up cards. So, anytime it was someone's birthday, I would make this elaborate. You'd open the card, and this like bear would pop up and say "Happy birthday" with these big teeth and stuff. And uh, uh, so, I just enjoyed that. And people would enjoy it, so you get that two way uh, feedback out of it. And then uh, with paper mache, you make monsters and make a mess, and I just love that um mm -hmm. and um yeah and so and then so I just pursued that my mom was great like she put she put me in art classes when I was 10 you know which not a lot of people do so then I already knew about shading and that kind of thing even before I got to that high they start teaching that more at high school level so that helped advance it because art really is a you know if you think you can't do it you, you can if you keep if you keep doing it, you can do it like everything, anything you do every day, you get, you get really good at. And, um, mm. and when you love it, it's easy to do it every day. So if you don't love it, don't worry. <laughs> but if you love it, and if you suck, that's okay. Yeah. You, can, uh, <laughs> you can keep going. So would you, would you say interesting? Cause it sounds like you're, you're saying that you love this thing, but you didn't really talk about any natural gift with art for yourself. Do you feel that you are kind of naturally gifted to doing different types of art? Yeah, I guess so. Um, like I remember my grade three um, picture of a bear eating blueberries and it had like 
you know, had had a background and things were smaller in the back and the, and the teacher was like, well, you're an artist. You know? so, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's some natural, and my Opa was a good artist and one of my cousins is, is a fantastic artist and he's, hmm. he works with, he makes videos now and branding and that kind of thing. It's amazing. The memories that stand out sometimes, right? That one, that one teacher in grade three. Um, okay. So, so you you kind of said okay I like I want to do something creative in, in in the world of art this this industrial design seems like a practical way that I can learn how to help people be happy through products and then in that process you realized oh this is perhaps not exactly what I wanted or not what I want to spend my time doing when I leave and then you eventually did a master's in strategic leadership towards Sustain. sustainability so can you tell us about that shift like how did you go into that space from industrial design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when I was thinking about, uh, I was having the sustainable design project, we said uh, we have these soap dispensers, they have a, a disposable portion where you get a, you fill up the soap dispenser every month with the new cartridge. Um, and that part then goes in the garbage every time. And so they said, what if we used compostable plastic? Cause like, we'd heard about that, will that, will that sort of solve this, uh, this sustainability issue? And so I started researching it and I said, oh, yeah, how do you know, how much does it cost? What do you, how do you use to sustain it? What are the different types of uh, compostable plastics and what happens to them when you throw them out? And then I realized, and then as I made my phone calls, I would like called the, the composting sites and everything. I said, oh, do you, so when you guys get the compostable plastics, how does it work? And they were like, what are compostable plastics? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> like if we make, a, if we make 300,000 compostable soap dispensers they're not going to get composted they don't the system mm. doesn't know how to do that yet oh. and then i do the life cycle analysis where you add up all the all the the the, the impacts of, of all the decisions in the in the product and our what we were doing was pretty was kind of optimal in that in that framework because uh you know it was a recyclable plastic and not too heavy and all that sort of stuff and uh but anyway, so what I realized as through that through that research was like, oh, it's not about the product; it's about the system that the product's in. We're in it. We're in an unsustainable system, and mm. so to change, and so you can't tell your boss to do something different in a system that can't accept that change. So I was like, ooh, <laughs> like, ooh. <laughs> so that um, so then I I'd, I'd read about this natural step framework, and it was about how do you change the system and how do you. How do you have this framework that makes that puts all the pieces together so it makes sense? Um, and so I made some presentations to my senior management level about that, and they were very impressed. And they're like, "Oh yes, this is where we want to go. What do we do? Tell us the three steps." And I said, "Well, here's the process." And they said, "No, no, but what? Like, what are the three steps? Like, <laughs> tell me." And they're like, "No, it's kind of bigger than that." So um, anyway, so I was like, "Okay, I'm going to go to the university and learn this natural step process in in Sweden." And so that was a really great really great experience with people from all over the world who really cared about sustainability um, in a beautiful place. Mm. And so, yeah, we didn't mention that you went to school in Sweden too, which is, you know, interesting. So then you, and then you eventually went back to work in England. I'm gathering, you went to school in Sweden, you came home to Canada and then eventually went, you know, kept working and then went back to England to, to keep working for that company. No, uh, after I quit the company, cause they were, they liked my ideas, but they weren't actually couldn't actually do it or implement it. They weren't the best company for me. Um, and so after after universe, after the Sweden Masters, I went home to Canada and took my new husband, my almost husband, home with me. Um, and uh, from there, and then so then I got a job with the Natural Step Canada, which was nice so for a while until until some other NGO work in that country. Okay. Okay. So it was England first to work and before the masters with that old company. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And so, so help, help me and, and others understand. It sounds, if I'm understanding correctly, that, you know, as you gained experience and exposure and education, you kind of had um, at least these two parts of you. One was, you know, making art and one was helping the world be more sustainable and I see those still in parallel based on kind of some of the things that you do. And of course, I understand that your mission is to kind of help those interact. But tell us a little bit, if you can, about those two facets of your life. How do you implement them? How do they cross over? 
Yeah, so it's like it's been a little bit of a process of zooming out and zooming out and zooming out as I go and I'm thinking about like, oh, what's my life for? What's it? What matters? What am I going to give my energy to? And um, so first I thought like, oh, how do I help people? Maybe there's maybe I can help poor people somehow. And then I read about environmental crisis and I was just like, oh, I was like, that sounds really important. Okay, I'm going to focus there, like, because this uh, ecological crisis is really a big deal and then um and then I was like oh the system <laughs> you know then then like oh the, the way business works is what's creating unsustainability all oh, the system needs to change and then like oh it's the way it's the way <laughs> the, it's the way we think and the way we've grown up um this whole world view needs to like uh, needs to shift in our consciousness so like it kind of keeps going um sort of like expanding out in layers of of complexity as they get older and sex stays pretty simple though in the end but um, so, so now I'm using, um, my facilitation, my facilitation skills in visioning and strategy and, and the art to help, um, to help the people who want to change the world, uh, to, to organize. Um, and so the big vision right now is called love organized. So how are we, some people like they meditate a lot and full of love and then, but and they want the world to be better, but they don't know what to do sort of and other people are really strong in their minds and businesses but they don't know how to kind of get out of the system and so I'm like I think I we can bridge those make a new system where we can it's infused with love so that we are creating a sustainable system so that, that's hard to explain I guess in a few words mm -hmm. but. yeah no I think it I think it's I think it's really interesting personally and I also think and my interpretation too is that we haven't talked much about this graphic facilitation. So I'd love for you to explain to everyone how that came to be and any other details you want to share. But it sounds like that is kind of your vehicle to, in some sense, make a living, although I'm sure that you enjoy it. You can tell us if you do or not. But then there's this other bigger mission. So it's almost like this work that you built skills and you built a business around and it's kind of um, providing you some income and, and probably some fulfillment, but then there's this other bigger picture thing that you're working towards, which is the more spiritual, ecological, sustainable path. Is that fair to say that they're kind of, one is feeding the other? Yeah, the, um, definitely the, I was, I built up the graphic recording over time. Like I was working part-time at an, N, an NGO um, that doesn't pay very well, but for, you know, for education, for sustainability, and then I was just building up slowly my business on the side. So it was only making, you know, I only made a couple thousand one year. And then I sort of managed and I would doubled it and doubled it again and doubled it again until it would could be until it could be a full time. Um, if full, uh, almost full time um, salary. And then that gave me space. Then I was as um, because it's uh I get a lot of money for sh for one day. I, then it gives me more spaciousness to do more of this volunteering and thinking about the bigger ideas and that sort of thing. So it feeds me to to go and participate in these bigger conversations around the world and try and and really try and really bring my fullness best mm -hmm. of myself forward. Um, it's like I sort of found a bit of a magic formula, I guess, or something. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was really thankful for that job because it gets me that I can have more time with my kids. So they don't they don't have school on Wednesdays in France. So like move to France for that, geez. And, <laughs> and uh, so that I can play with my kids every Wednesday and I make my own schedule and I just love that. And then have this space to try it to work on my own inner development and leadership. Hmm. Uh, well, I lost the question. Yeah. So what would you say to, that's great. And what would you say to young people who feel that they have creative pursuits that they, they'd like to follow and then they're artistic and, you know, the messaging that they're often getting is, you know, choose something more practical. You'll never make a living. Like what would you, what advice or suggestions would you share for, for people in that situation? Yeah, I guess like I was, that's what I thought as like, well, I can't be an artist. So what can I do that adds some science to it or something, you know, <laughs> it's gotta be STEM, you know, but um, so that's why I did industrial design. Um, but then that part of it still, still wasn't for me and that just had to get there. Um, but it did help me, you know, get the grounded and, and discipline. Um, so, I, but I just think there's a lot of different 
jobs, especially now, I think art is even more um, and creativity is valued even more than it has been in the past. And there's so many, so many ways to make money now and so many ways to make your own business and so many ways to be a creator and have a YouTube channel or create a product or create a service of something you've learned and then you can teach it to the next people. And um, so um, uh, if you can, you can, you can bring your artistic and creative gifts and you can make a career of it. And, and you have to be, you have to find that discipline in yourself to find to find that way that it's paid. Cause there's not going to be a job description. You're not going to look on a job site and it's going to be your perfect job. You have to actually create it. So like looking at some, doing some really basic marketing and business courses that are a lot of them, there's a lot online. There's a lot in your, in the basic university and college materials to say, okay, this is how you, this is how you figure out your product. This is how you get to your market. This is how you, you know, um, so some of those business skills you have mm. to, you have to really um and it's hard to do on, on your own so that's why i like to try and um, connect in with networks and stuff and show up in networks and get to know people so then you can meet your 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 sort of friends and you can offer your gifts and then your friends sort of become your clients and then you can uh, grow that up so for me it was this art of hosting network of people who i really enjoyed their company and they happen to be organizational development um, consultants who, and those are the people who hire graphic uh, facilitators. So I had this friend network and then they started hiring me and that's how I mm. made my business. So you have to do it businesses as personal connections and, and, uh, and showing up and being, being good with give, showing up sort of generous for the whole, being a leader in by organizing things or by speaking about big ideas and that sort of thing. And that's what I show. It's my philosophy called show up and be awesome. So, and that's how you create opportunities for yourself. And so, and especially with your, especially with your heart-based gifts, I think that's, uh, that, that's my advice. It's, uh, mm. Show up, which, which means like go somewhere where there's other people so that you're making connections and be awesome, offer something, give something, lead something. Amazing. So I'm hearing a lot of, yeah, you know, like so there's some business kind of knowledge, marketing and business mm -hmm. operations, but I'm also hearing a lot of what people would perhaps characterizes entrepreneurial traits and skills as well, getting out there, being resourceful, you know, not confining yourself to a job title, but looking beyond that and thinking really about how you can offer things in a new way, which I love. And that's um, what we talk about quite a bit at Discover Year as well. I can okay. show, I can just show one of my graphic recordings. Yes, just so please. You have a sense please. Of that. I don't know if I have, I don't, I'm probably not a co-host or whatever at the minute. Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what it looks like. So it's a big, a big day long meeting and they're talking about, uh, and I have the title and then all these different pieces of it happen. And then they, they create a metaphor that they're talking about how they want to grow. Um, and then there's different, you know, different pieces to the puzzle that they're putting together. And then I try to show the people and what they're saying. Uh, and then they see their logo and they see themselves and their metaphor coming to life. Um, and this is a really big, a really big uh, eight foot wide paper in the room. So it's, uh, right. it brings a lot of energy and grounds their vision and it brings uh, joy. Amazing. And you're doing this just so everyone understands that you are doing this live, those, the painting and the drawing, you're doing that while the meeting is happening. Yeah. With markers and pastels. Yeah. yeah. So cool. And then, and then on my iPad, it's more same thing, but just smaller and uh, digital. I'd love to return to something that you said, because I'm curious, I really connected with when you were sharing about, hey, when I'm trying to, you know, attract clients and make quotes for people to do this graphic facilitation, you know, you said 50% of the time, if you just send them an email with a quote, you know, here's how much it'll cost, you know, 50% of the time you get that work 90% of the time when you actually are able to have a video call or a phone call. And I have that exact same experience. And, you know, um, I, I'm similarly, you know, trying to get clients in the work that I do. So my question to you is what what is it exactly about that meeting as compared to an email that helps you get more business or connect more with those people? What is what is the key thing that's happening there? Yeah. Um, somebody giving you money, somebody paying you for your service, it's an act of trust. And it's almost an act of intimacy. 
And um, I kind of joke, I liken it to a kiss. So if you are walking down the street and someone yells at you, hey, you want a kiss? Do you, do you want to kiss them? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> hey, give me a job. Hey, here's my card. Hey, I need a job. You know, that's, uh, hey, give me money. Hey, do you want to donate to Greenpeace? Like, oh, leave me alone. I'm, I'm busy. You know, but if you, um, someone has to, I heard this framework recently, very nice. They have to, they have to know, like, and, and trust you. And then they'll, and then that develops enough relationship, um, to offer, to exchange money because money's an energy of, of exchange. Mm. Um, and I'm learning it and it's an infinite money is infinite and you are infinite. I, okay. And, and so, um, <laughs> and so, um, uh, um, um, so then, yeah. So when you make eye contact with someone, even through zoom, it's close enough to eye contact. And when you go and you find the people who are interested in, in connecting and want the things that you can give, like, you go to a if you go to the nightclub you're you find people your age who want to have fun and who who might like to kiss uh tonight you know and so and there's music and so then you're and then you're and then you're dancing and then you're touching and then maybe and then maybe you're kissing you know? and so you're um and then it feels just natural and nobody's like pulling it from the other person it's the it's, it's a romantic moment but I'm on the bridge and it just and it feels right um mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm not romantic with my clients but it's just my funny way of um teaching myself to not like ask too soon and uh and just be focused on the money it's really about the relationships and the and the trust mm -hmm. and is, is it safe to say that in those meetings you're doing quite a bit of listening to because you mentioned earlier hearing about their needs yeah when they when they start talking about their event and their vision they hear, they light up and then all i have to do is reflect that back to them how beautiful their thing is and then that's what makes people like you or or find you interesting when you listen to them and light them up and rather than trying to tell them how great um i am or my services so that's really uh, a yeah. yeah i think it's such a useful message and this is something that we talk about with our students and i think most people in the world especially young people get the messaging you're trying to get a job you're trying to do sell something get out there give them your pitch you know fine-tune your pitch and be ready to go and you know be confident and and i of course to some degree that is eventually helpful but what is no one is ever saying is that the most critical part is to understand the person that you are trying mm -hmm. to work with so i appreciate that you're sharing this about you know really reflecting back because we work on uh active listening skills a lot in discovery because they're such useful skills mm -hmm. so i appreciate that you're that you are saying hey it's great to be able to be confident but the first step is helping that person light up yeah. And they're discovering what they need. And then you're saying, if you have that for them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an important message because in today's world, so many young people, especially are used to communicating, you know, with their thumbs and it's the world that they live lived in. And then we had COVID. And so um, I think it's pretty easy for all of us today. Oh, it's just easier. Let me send the email. Let me send the text. And the truth is that there's just so much happening <laughs> in our brains when we meet people in person and see them and hear their voice, um, if possible, that that's just a, it's something that you can't really understand until you experience it in a repeated way, how beneficial it is, you know? So our message is to get out there, like you said earlier, get out there, meet people, try new stuff. Yeah. And to do, and to work with yourself on like, um, that you value yourself and that you have worth so that when you show up, you're showing up in a way that you're, that you're not too, you're not too scared or, or acts, you know, um, sometimes when you're, when you're not, uh, you know, securing yourself, you'll say, oh, you'll say, oh, I don't know, but maybe, uh, I do this, but it's no good. And you, you can't help it because you have, um, it always sort of leaks through what your, your sad part, your little baby parts are. And so if you can work on your, if you can work on that in yourself, um, find some programs and helps that do that. Then when you show up in difficult situations where you're a bit stressed, that stuff doesn't all have to leak through so mm. much, but that's a life, that's a lifelong, uh, journey. Mm. So is that sounds like, um, I think, you know, for, It'll certainly be true for to varying degrees for varying people, but because you're bringing up this idea of perhaps the negative self talk or you know lower self esteem, it, how did you? Is that been something that you remember at the beginning? You would show up quite differently than now, and 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 how did you 
how did, if that's the case, if you've grown, how did you find a way to do that? Yeah, I took a course called Feminine Power, and it was um, it was it was sort of spiritually framed, but it's really just norm basic psychology uh, that you, that many of the different the um, processes use, and it's just about and it's the same thing. It's listening to your own feelings and say so. You're treating yourself like you would treat someone who's sad, that who you love, because uh, often we kind of get mad at ourselves and judge ourselves. But if you actually kind of pretend that that younger sadder part of you is your little puppy or is is some a friend that you love and you treat them like that and say oh how are you feeling oh i see that you're feeling sad oh what do you need uh, oh you need to be seen you need to be loved oh well, i see you and i love you <laughs> so it's um it's this um so it's like actually just practicing doing that quite often they they call it like a daily power practice um, and so I, when I was being an executive director for the first time at a charity and it was overwhelming and I couldn't do it all and so many, you know, failure, you know, can't do this, can't do that, forgot that there's too many emails. I can't, can't raise all this money on this tiny charity with no, with no support. You know, um, I'd be driving to work and just be like, oh, I can't do this. And then I'd be like, then I'm like <laughs> listening to my feminine power practice. Like, okay, I can, I was going to feed myself here to make it through. Uh, mm. these busy times yeah very cool very cool and so that some of that uh, i'm assuming has stayed with you since that so you've carried that over those lessons and the self-talk into your career now yeah i mean i was lucky that my mom gave us a lot of positive talk like her mom didn't like her mom was pretty rough a uh, german parents after the war and she decided that she was just gonna love us so much so i have a big thankful head start from that i don't have that but for i have, I have some positive um mm. frames in my head but you can make that for your, if your parents weren't able to do that for you you can do it for yourself and then you to give that gift to the next generation of of flipping that and i think that's the most beautiful gift you can give to the world yeah 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 the um self-compassion which you're describing is something that we that we do focus on at discovery year because there are so many people that are harder on themselves than they are on their loved ones so i think that's an important message to take away is to just reflect back and think would i be treating someone else the way i'm treating myself right now yeah okay i i'd love to we only have a, a couple minutes left here but i'd love to just hit a couple topics that we like to maybe in a bit of a rapid fire um manner and i'm sure that our students when you meet with them they'll have some some other great questions for you um but just out of curiosity, we talked about things in, uh, that you do for fun and singing on, on your way to school sounds like maybe is, is part of it. And, you know, art, of course. But do you have any other pastimes or hobbies that you like to take up on a pretty regular basis? Um, I've tried to keep up with volleyball here and there, but I've let, let it fall recently. Um, but that was nice to because it's a kind of an instant either a group of friends to play with wherever you go you can find the the volleyball team or some kind of tried field hockey and in, in when i was in england so i find joining a sports team is a good way to get into a new place and find some friends and that sort of thing um but i like to do my yoga here and there um, but i just do it at home now and going for the walk and i do my ukulele lessons and singing i've singing lessons and ukulele lessons uh, once a week and then i have to do French classes as well because I'm only a medium at French um and so yeah so it keeps me pretty busy among the kids and we got a new puppy this year so she keeps us busy and happy nice so some some of your hobbies are kind of intentional in saying I want to do this you know there's some physical benefits but also it's mostly to connect with others and then you have other hobbies it sounds like that are really more for you but kind of alone Mm -hmm. yeah the music in ukulele is really the only it's, i realized like like wow this is really for me like i wouldn't i don't usually do stuff just for me so that was the that was mm -hmm. when, I, when i realized that i was like oh good <laughs> yeah yeah very interesting okay what about um you mentioned failing a lot or the having the impression of failing a lot when you were executive director for a charity but we off, we also like to ask is there a, a recent or important failure that you want to tell us about briefly and and anything you learned from it uh, well, we're, I'm trying to do this course uh, for Amplify Each Other's Light, and it's about like a business course, how to bring your gifts into the world. And um, so it's I'm, I was like, I want to learn this, so I'm going to do it uh, with some friends. And then so we we 
did it and we reached out and we got quite a few people interested and then like comes to the point we're asking for money and I'm like I hope you'll come join us and uh, <laughs> I do a very good job at, like at the end my colleagues are like mm, Kira, <laughs> that wasn't the that wasn't the strongest pitch you did there um and then um <clears throat> Uh, and then somebody signed up and paid. And then in the chat, I um, she was saying something, and I said, "Oh, don't share that in the chat because we want to keep, you know, we want to keep this place bloody." But and she got really mad and offended and quit and wanted her money back. And so I lost. So I, so we didn't. So we didn't make any money on the course. And mm -hmm. was, oh. but um, but what I was also felt there was that what I've also discovered there is that the if the course is about sort of abundance and even though the it's not a lot of the money's not really coming in easily to get people convinced to to pay us for for this service it takes time to like build up you know that confidence and that enough people coming that some of them want to pay it's like it's like a numbers game you need a thousand you need to find a thousand people and four you know a hundred of them will show up and five of them will pay so we've only found a hundred people so only one of them is paid you know mm -hmm. and so um uh but then this ab abundance has come in other ways. So I, because I was reaching out to newsletters to promote the course, somebody found me and and wanted to and felt, oh, I like you. There's something about you. And then now he's being my mentor in in abundance. And so so I got this, and he's offering that for me for no for no cost. So I'm like, ah, so this I'm getting the abundance, but it's coming. It's not. It doesn't always come the way transactionally mm -hmm. the way you think. So that's kind of fun failure. Yeah. Yeah. I relate to that a lot, um, in particular with Discover Year, because we, you know, it's our eighth year this year. We've never, you know, the program doesn't make money. We just make enough to kind of pay for the bare minimum to keep the program going for, you know, uh, salaries and operational costs. But when I think about it, there's so many other so many other benefits that I've drawn from it that I would never have been able to imagine, you know, including connections mm -hmm. like like you and getting to know a lot of our mentors and having the experiences and learning from our students and meeting the parents. And so I, I really resonate with that. And I think it's an important message for people to uh, hear to say, hey, like you might have goal money as a goal as your first goal here, but be open to the other goals that might arise or benefits that might arise along the way in, in your endeavor. Cool. OK. Um, you live in France and you've been to England. You studied in Sweden. Uh, as you know, in our program, the students travel, usually in the month of February. So we often like to hear what's your favorite place that you've ever traveled to and why? Well, I guess it's got to be that Fintorn eco village because I had my most uh, transformative experiences there because there would be a conference and people who would come and speak were really world leader people and they would be really good at facilitating processes where you have a lot of feelings and and uh and I would spend I'd spent a week there and then a weekend and then a month because it's just like all, they're all just so good and kind and uh and joy and um teaching you to be your best and all that sort of thing so that's really my favorite place in the world. And they're, uh, they're struggling right now because of COVID. And then somebody set fire to a couple of their buildings. And mm. um, so I want to try and support them somehow if I can. And, mm. you know. and that was in Sweden? That was in Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure that might pique the interest of some of our, uh, some of our listeners or our watchers here today to check that out. What was the name of it again? Uh, Findhorn Eco Village. It's spelled like find horn, and Findhorn. they have this experience week, and you go for a week, and you learn how to be like a, open up to your spiritual side of yourself. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, last question uh, to wrap up, if that's okay with you. And we call these good life conversations, and the point of the title is that uh, a good life does not uh, equate to what job you have or what particular circumstance you're in, but it involves historically, anyways meaningful work, good relationships, different endeavors, you know, exploring the world, uh, learning in an ongoing way. So uh, for the group of young people that are listening in today, what advice would you offer them uh, in their pursuit of creating a good life? Yeah, my, my, my younger colleagues took me out to lunch one day and she said, Kara, you seem like happy or something. She's like, what do you, how do you navigate? How do you make your choices? I was like, oh. I'm honored that you're asking me. Well, 
you know, and uh, and I said, oh, I think it's it's like there's this feeling, you know, and it's like almost like you had a little antenna in front of you, and when uh, and you sort of <laughs> go around, and when you when you're in a certain situation or place, it kind of goes ah, and like your your body lights up, and your heart lights up, and your mind, and it feels and and I feel good, and that's like a an indicator that like this is my direction. And when I'm in another space and I feel small and scared and constricted and I don't like how they're talking and I don't like how they're treating each other, um, that's not space for me. You know, even maybe they're in this space, they're making a lot of money <laughs> in this space. They're not making a lot of money, but maybe I can find a way to, um, you know, find the balance in, in there. Um, hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, I guess I have a using a lot of courage, um, but I always say sort of like it's sort of like smart risks. Like I always make sure the foundations are secure. Like you have a place to live and you have like a part time job or something, and so you, there's some level of sacrifice. There's always some part that it's not so great to do, but that's what you do to have your foundations in place and to give yourself space for the. Or that whatever that tingle is to make sure that you're nurturing making space and so nurturing that yeah. mm. i like that you bring up this idea of some 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 sense of sacrifice or and, and discipline to understand that you're not going to have everything all at once but that you can have these you know build something some foundation and then and then invest the rest of your time in something that you love especially at the beginning and with the hope i assume of getting you know increasing the percentage of time on the things that really fulfill you and that you find meaningful yeah yeah in that sense it's like a like a game of monopoly but not, but in a better way that like it's 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 hard at the beginning but then once you start getting the pieces in place then they start, then the, the energy um, keeps going uh, and gets easier as, mm -hmm. as I go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So listen to your antenna and understand that, you know, if you want to get to a meaningful place or find fulfillment, it usually takes some degree of sacrifice, especially at the beginning. Yeah. And that courage and creativity, because it's not, it's not going to be handed to you because uh, it's not, everything's not organized that way yet, but it's our job to make it that way. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Kara. Good. Thanks so much. I always enjoy talking to you so much, Jay. Me too. And I know that our students will benefit a lot from this and uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll have some good questions for you and for uh, the rest of our audience members. Thanks for tuning in. This has been another good life conversation and we hope to have you at the next one. Mm -hmm.